Hello, everyone. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989, and I'm the Vice President for Alumni Relations at the University and President of your Columbia Alumni Association that connects over 355,000 alumni worldwide. We're excited to have you here with us during this time for the first Columbia at Home webinar series. We've created this series during this unprecedented time to engage and connect with all of you. We will be showcasing alumni, faculty, administrators, all members of the Columbia community to share what's happening at the university, updates on what's happening at the medical center with COVID-19, as well as intellectual programming and entertaining programming. So we're so excited for you to be here with us now, and we encourage you to send us suggestions of what you would like to hear in the future. We're joined by Columbia University trustee and graduate of the School of Journalism, Alilia Bundles. She is an author and journalist who writes biographies about the amazing women in her family. On her own ground, her biography of her great-great-grandmother, Madam C.J. Walker, is a New York Times notable book and has just been reissued in a new edition under the title Self Made. The book is the source of the fictionalized four part Netflix series starring Octavia Spencer that premiered on March 20th of this year. Alilia had a 30 year career as an execu executive and Emmy award winning producer with ABC News and NBC News and is now at work on her fifth book, The Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alelia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance, about her great-grandmother, whose parties, arts, patronage, and travels helped define the era. She'll be joined in conversation with Professor Farrah Jasmine Griffin. Professor Griffin is the William B. Ransford Professor of English and Comparative Literature and African American Studies at Columbia University. She is the chair of our African American and African Diaspora Studies Department. Her major fields of interest are American and African American literature, music, and history. And she has published widely on issues of race and gender, feminism, and cultural politics. Her most recent book, Harlem Nocturne, Women Artists and Progressive Politics During World War II was published by Basic Books in 2013. During the conversation and at the conclusion, you will be able to enter questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. If you're watching on YouTube, you can leave a question as a comment. I'm pleased to welcome Alilia Bundles and Farah Jasmine Griffin. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. As we're all social distancing. Right. And welcome to everybody who's tuning in. Yes, we're so glad that you um, took the time to join us. Um, we've been looking forward to this conversation for some time. So we'll just jump right in. Right. Um, so, Alilia, uh, a number of people have seen um, Self Made, which is the Netflix series that was inspired by your book on her own ground which is the biography you wrote about your great great grandmother madam cj walker uh, before we get into it it's a beautiful series visually beautiful very inspirational um, but not a lot of people know that that book and then it's inspiring uh, as inspiration for the series has a columbia j school connection and j school for those people who don't know is the columbia school of journalism um, could you talk a little bit about that connection between the Columbia J School and your writing that wonderful book? Sure. And, you know, and it really is, this is a story of a professor changing somebody's life. I know you do that all the time. When I was a student uh, at Columbia at the J School in the fall of 1975, Phyllis Garland, who was mm -hmm. the first Black woman on the faculty there, uh, was my advisor for my master's paper and Phil recognized my unusually spelled name, A apostrophe, capital L, E-L-I-A. And Phil said to me, 
Um, your name is Alelia. Do you have any connection to Madam Walker and Alelia Walker? And I suspect Phil knew the answer. Her mother had been an editor at the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a very famous black newspaper that many people will recognize. And she had been a reporter at Jet and Ebony. But I wasn't walking around talking about my family. Um, and I said to her, I said, yes, that, that's my family. And she said, that is what you're going to write your paper about. And I think I'm sure I had given her some very cliched, you know, boring topics, but Phil really changed my life because she validated that story for me at a time when nobody else was knocking on my door saying you need to write about it. So I, I really owe a serious debt of gratitude to her. Well, we're so glad that you acknowledge her. And even in the book, you know, in the preface, the prologue to the book, you talk about her. Um, she's truly a pioneer. Um, and for people who are watching who don't know her, now you do. She's an extraordinary, extraordinary journalist and, and professor who inspired um, Alelia. How did your training as a journalist help you shape the way you researched the book you wrote about your own family? Because there's a sense that you probably grew up with a number of stories and you grew up in the thick of it. Um, what did journalist training bring to that enterprise for you? You know, I began to really discover things about these famous family members of mine before I could read. So when I was a really little kid, I would, in my grandmother's dresser drawer, I found a mother of pearl opera glasses that had belonged to Madam Walker and Alelia Walker. And these little miniature mummy charms that Alelia Walker had gotten on a trip to Cairo in 1922. So, you know, the silverware that we used every day had CJW Madam Walker's monogram. But I wasn't really focused on that. And we didn't sit around the dinner table talking about Madam Walker. My real um, passion was writing. So I followed this interest as a journalist, came to the J School. And even though I had written my paper at the J School about Madam Walker, I went to work uh, because I didn't have a trust fund <laughs> at, uh, at NBC News as a producer. I did that for 30 years at NBC and ABC. But along the way, I was really gathering the skills as a journalist and researching and interviewing, uh, storytelling, uh, and all of those things that I learned as a journalist really, I think, helped me tell this story in a way, in a cinematic way, uh, but also because of a fidelity to the facts. I really believe in the facts. Yeah, it's, um, if, if people haven't read the book, I encourage them to do so. It's, it's a wonderful way of telling the story with lots of detail and extraordinary context. Um, you, you, you had to do a lot of work that a historian would do as well, clearly, the, visiting archives and things like that as well, is that in addition to interviewing it seems. You know, I feel like I'm part of the community of historians, um, though I do not have the PhD. But very early on when I was doing the research, there's an organization, as you know, called the Association of Black Women Historians. And that group of women really embraced me and were very helpful to me as I was doing my research. And my research intersected with the kinds of books that they were writing. So I did, in fact, travel to more than a dozen cities, and I went through, you know, I became very familiar with, at that point, microfilm <laughs> <laughs> and, and dusty, dusty archives and original manuscript collections. So I used my research skills and my journalism skills in the same way that a historian would investigate and interrogate the historical record. Yeah. No, it's clearly, um, I think, a very strong work of history as well, and then you're a beautiful writer, so the story you tell is really um, exciting to read. Um, what did you grow up calling or referring to your great-great-grandmother? Did you call her Madam? <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you know, sometimes young people say, did you ever meet her? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> so she died, Madam C.J. Walker was born Sarah Breedlove in, 1867 on the same plantation where her parents and old she died in 1919. Yeah. Alelia Walker was born in 1885, died in 1931. I wasn't born until 1952, which is a really long time ago, but not that long ago. And but you know, I I mean, I've always called her Madam. And that and that is the because my mother was vice president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company. 
she went to work there every day. But I think part of the way that I learned the story about her was from her secretary, a woman named Violet Davis Reynolds, who had gone to work for the Walker Company in 1914 when she was a teenager. And when I was growing up and when I was at Columbia and then even afterwards, Mrs. Reynolds still was working for the company. And she was my real first you know, connection to Madam Walker because she revered Madam Walker. She had worked in the office. She was the keeper of the flame. And she always called her Madam. And so that's what I called her. Wow, there's so many fascinating characters that um, you encounter along the way as you, as you tell this story. Um, the Netflix series was the number one show uh, the first weekend that it aired. Um, so I just wanted to know if you were, like, were you surprised by that? What has it been like to see your work um, from a book that you researched and wrote about your family be translated to the screen? What has that experience been like for you in the weeks, well, leading up to the airing of it and then in the weeks since it became available. Well, yes, just an amazing thing to have Octavia Spencer play Madam Walker. I mean, she was great. And really for me, every time she came on the screen, I felt that the p things on the page were really coming to life. So she was, she was perfect in embodying the strength and the courage and tenacity of Madam Walker. And Netflix really invested a lot in promoting it. And they really see it as a vehicle for her so that meant that there were billboards in Times Square, though nobody saw them because people were social distancing and billboards on Sunset, but lots of media and lots leading up to it. And I think people were very excited, uh, a, a lot of anticipation because Madam Walker's story is fascinating. And even though most people who watched really didn't know a lot about Madam Walker that first weekend, her name now is all over the world, millions of people have learned about her. So it was very exciting to see the enthusiasm with which it was greeted. Were you involved in the production in any way? Um, you know, you, you're, you had the book and they referred to that, but were you involved? Were you consulted along the way? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes <laughs> no. But I think that anybody who's listening who has been involved in anything that has to do with Hollywood or getting you know, a project, a written project to the screen or to the stage, there are various iterations. And usually what happens is a writer writes a book and you option it to Hollywood. And then they kind of really, in many instances, wish the writer would go away. So the writer doesn't have a whole lot to do once the property essentially has been sent over to someone else. In my case, I had what was called script review which meant I was able to read some of the scripts, but I was less involved in the development of the storyline than I had hoped I would be. But at the same time, I, my, um, my research was used by the script writers. So, you know, it's a Hollywood version of history and um, those are always uh, different. They're in, well, it, they say it's inspired by, right? It's not, um, trying to be exactly true to history. As you were watching it, can you let us know how much of it is fact, what we saw, and how much of it is fiction? So um, most of it is fiction. But the thing, I think that what you, the thing that comes across is the strength. I mean, because Octavia Spencer is so strong in the role, and it's fact that Madam Walker built a business, that she started as a washerwoman, uh, and this, and her hair began to fall out and she developed a hair care product and you know, then built a business and hired many women and in fact had a mansion in Irvington, New York. So, the, and then her daughter persuaded her to, uh, that they needed to have a presence in Harlem. So on 136th Street where the County Cullen Library is now, that's where their townhouse was. So those sort of rough pieces are true. But there were many fictional characters. Cleophas was a fictional character. Sweetness, the numbers runner, was fictional. Esther was a fictional character. Uh, and some of the things, the confrontation with Booker T. Washington didn't really happen. Madam Walker never went to John D. Rockefeller's house <laughs> and on his lawn. But I think the thing that is um, 
you know, sort of most controversial and discussed that didn't happen is the relationship between Madam Walker and her rival. Addie Monroe is the composite character who appears in the series. In real life, Madam Walker's rival was a woman named Annie Malone, who she in fact did work for as an agent. But it was, the story is um, sort of compressed and dramatized to make it seem like there was a conflict between the two women because one was light, because Annie, Annie Malone, Addie Monroe was light skinned and was really casting shade and disparagement on Sarah Breedlove. And that really didn't happen. And she didn't follow her. In fact, when I was writing On Her Own Ground, I did a lot of research on Annie Malone and discovered that she was a very successful businesswoman, a philanthropist, and um, somebody who up uplifted the women in the Black community in the same way Madam Walker did. So that is kind of Hollywood, Real Housewives of Atlanta version <laughs> instead of what, you know, the fact that these two women were both really important and and equals and rivals so why do you think it is that um we know more about madam cj walker i mean i think that most um young black girls growing up who get our like kind of quick negro history version of history okay. certainly know the name madam cj walker was was it a matter of her ability to get her name out there or was it her involvement in so many different things outside of kind of the beauty culture world? Yeah, that's a great question. And it really does speak to making sure that you preserve your records <laughs> uh, in, in many ways. But there are a few things that I've come to think over the years. Madam Walker died in 1919 at the height of her fame. She had just moved into this mansion in Irvington, New York in the wealthiest community in America. That mansion is still standing. Uh, and as a National Historic Landmark. But it was written about in the New York Times Magazine in November of 1918. So her stage was really big. Annie Malone, her main competitor, lived another four decades and went through a bad divorce and some tax problems and bankruptcies. And so by the time she died, although she had been a very important person, her estate and her influence had dwindled. Another thing that's key is that Madam Walker really uh, knew how to pick talented people. She surrounded herself, her C-suite, as we would say now, F.B. Ransom, who's in the film, but I think is, kind of, is not given his full due. Um, F.B. Ransom was her attorney, and he really protected her and kept her safe from lawsuits and, you know, operated the business day to day. And the secretary, De Violet Davis Reynolds, Mrs. Reynolds was still there in the same building and she preserved all of the records. So we literally have tens of thousands of business records, personal letters, annual reports, tax records. And that is what really allowed me to be able to write the story in such detail. Now most of those papers have been digitized and are at the Indiana Historical Society. And I think one other thing that's pretty key is that Alelia Walker, who's kind of portrayed as this flighty dilettante in the film, um, she did love having parties, but she also was the one who persuaded her mother that they needed to have a presence in Harlem. And she's the one who purchased the building in 1913 as Harlem was becoming the cultural and political mecca of Black America. And that meant that everybody who was coming to Harlem and writing about it was writing about them. So they were on a big platform. So I think those things all work together to make their legacy live a lot longer than some of their contemporaries. Wow, that's so exciting. We know that those of us who do work on Black women's history, how difficult it is to have access to those kind of archives um, and how rare, what a gift it is to have them. Um, so there are gonna be more Hopefully, there will be more films made about significant African American women. Um, we, we, you mentioned the um, the Association of Black Women Historians, who've been producing extraordinary work uh, for decades now, and a number of books that hopefully will inspire these kinds of films and series. Do you think that producers um, and studios have a sense of responsibility or an 
obligation, I should say, to get things right when they tell these stories? What do, what do you think is their responsibility? You know, I actually do. And I, but I sort of tempered that with this. I understand that a Hollywood depiction, you know, needs to have drama, needs to have composite characters, needs to compress time and place, and sometimes needs to overly dramatize something. But I think with these stories that stories of African-Americans, stories of people of color, stories of women, those are stories that have not really been told very much in Hollywood. And when they have been told, there's a long history of stereotypes and marginalization. And now there are all these untold stories, not just about Madam Walker, but about some people who are really famous who have not had films. Ida B. Wells, you know, needs a, needs a film. But, um, and then there are the everyday stories. I just finished reading uh, Sarah Broom's book, The Yellow House. I'd love to see that on screen. But, th you know, those, how do those stories get into a different formula for the way Hollywood has usually portrayed stories of people of color? So I do think that when there is the first pass of history, the more the story can be close to the, what actually happened, the better. And it's not a matter of trying to make people saints or trying to make them be perfect but let their flaws be as close to their real flaws as opposed to concocted flaws. Right, you know, they're, they're, you know some concocted um, conflict as we see in, in this one as well. Um, you know, just to back up a little bit, how, what was the journey getting Madam C.J. Walker's story to screen? Was this the first attempt? Had there been earlier attempts? Um, you know, I, when I read reread the book this time around, I thought, oh, this reads like something that should be a movie. And so I would imagine that, you know, did people approach you about doing something with it when the book came out? And what year was it originally published? So Hollywood? it was originally published in 2001. And it, and it is really one of those Hollywood sagas. Of, it took forever. In 1982, uh, Alex Haley actually came to us and he was still riding the crest of Roots and wanted to do a mini series and a, um, and a book. And I did the research for him. At that point, I was working as a producer for NBC in Atlanta. I took nine months off from my job, moved to New York for a few months, interviewed some of the Harlem Renaissance people who were still living at that point and put together all of this material for Alex. But Alex died in 1992 without having done a project. But that was okay. I think Alex sort of came into my life to, you know, create and open a door for me. Mm -hmm. And I had met his, his um, editor, Lisa Drew, who did Roots. And Lisa became my editor for the book that ultimately became On Her Own Ground. When that book was almost finished, the book was optioned by Columbia TriStar and CBS Television. But it was it it had went through development uh, purgatory as many books do, and that option came back to me. About five years later, there was another option from HBO that didn't get produced. The option came back, and then we had that sort of ten year period where the conventional wisdom in Hollywood was, you know, no black stories and only a few black actors will sell overseas, so we have no interest. And then April Rain's tweet, Oscar so white. And the butler and Selma and 12 Years a Slave began to change that narrative. And then my phone started ringing again. Wow. Wow. So I think most people don't know, you know, that, that, that things like that happen. That, you know, whenever, whenever you see a story that finally makes it to screen, there's usually something like what you're telling, a back and forth in a narrative. And, and it seems like the times themselves dictate when finally they're ready, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I was in watching the series this time, I thought with all of the interest in the kind of natural hair care movement and, and you know, all the hair um, entrepreneurs and, and, and things on video, that this seems like the perfect time in many ways for Madam C.J. Walker's story to, to make it to screen. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for it. What are you working on now? What, what's the next project? So I'm working on the Joy Goddess of Harlem. <laughs> and that is, the, that is a biography of my great-grandmother, Alelia Walker, my namesake. 
So she's who I really was interested in when I was growing up. When in my uh, in my grandfather's apartment, which had been my grandmother's apartment, there were things that when when Alelia Walker died in 1931, my grandmother had moved those things to her apartment in Indianapolis. So I had uh, books, Jean Toomer's Cane, and Count A. Cullen's Color, and Langston Hughes's The Weary Blues, first editions, books that had been in her library. And I was a senior in high school in 1970 and really just discovering Black literature and Black writers. So she was who was fascinating to me. And as I've done research for her with a really, really overdue, um, overdue book manuscript, people who write books understand, um, I have discovered she's so much more interesting than the little paragraph that usually appeared about her. The, the paragraph basically was, Madam Walker made the money, Alelia Walker spent the money, she had parties, the end. So, I, you know, nobody's that pathetic. But, <laughs> but in fact, she really was a major patron of the arts. She hosted the first show for Augusta Savage, the very well-known uh, African-American sculptor. She hired lots of Black musicians. She really was an impresario who, didn't, who knew how to throw big events. And more fascinating to me is that in 1921 and 22, she traveled, she, she went first class on the SS Paris, um, <laughs> arrived in France, uh, spent New Year's and Christmas in Paris, went to London, went to Cairo, the Holy Land, Rome for the coronation of the Pope, and to Addis Ababa to meet the Empress of Ethiopia. So she has a truly fascinating story. So we're looking forward to that one. I'm sure that's already being optioned as well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so were there things that you um, discovered about her that surprised you or um, that, you know, you, you, in talking about the things that you learned along the way, were there mm -hmm. things that really surprised you that weren't part of the family lore or... Well, that she real that Alelia Walker really was a patron of the arts and that she kind of had been pigeonholed. I mean, it it is sort of a normal tension in a story about a self-made businesswoman as a mother and a child who can't live up to the expectations. I mean, that's a natural tension. And so I wanted to both explore that, but also to figure out what was it that she wanted to do on her own you know who did she want to be and what was that struggle and then that she is so much a part of this generation you know we talk about the harlem renaissance but one of the things that i unpack is that that group of musicians and actors who are her age who were born in the 1880s mostly 1870s and 1880s are kind of the first wave of the talent the culture and then that next generation of Langston Hughes and Count A. Cullen and Zora Neale Hurston, even though she was older than she said she was. <laughs> but that group of writers were kind of the next wave. So really unpacking that. And then looking at the movement of Harlem. When we think of Harlem, we think of you know 125th Street to 145th Street and from the park over to Fifth Avenue, roughly. But it really migrated. It was much smaller when she first moved there. So to look at how Harlem changed over that decade and a half when she lived there was fascinating to me. Who came? Who was part of her social circle? So um, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. But the last question that I'll ask you is um, the series ends with um, Madam's death. Uh, and, you know, we get some insight into um, what might have happened with the company, but can you bring us, if not fully up to date, can you let us know what happened with the enterprise after her death? And be, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this that your mother um, ran the company when you were a girl. So can you just tell us a little bit about post Madam C.J. Walker, the Madam C.J. Walker enterprise? Sure. So, so many people, especially my journalism friends uh, and New Yorkers will know Jill Nelson, who is a well-known journalist who also went to the J School, and Jill's brother Stanley, who's the you know, Mac MacArthur winning documentary filmmaker. Their grandfather was F.B. Ransom, uh, who was in the film, Madam Walker's attorney and company general manager. So their family and my family remained involved, the next generation, the, our parents' generation remained involved with the company. 
the trademark for Walker products was sold to another entity in the mid 80s. And that wasn't a real thriving competitive company, but it never went out of business. And then Richard Lou Dennis, who people will know as the founding CEO of Sundial Brands and now the owner of Essence, bought the trademark in 2013 and has uh, developed a new line of products called MCJW um, that are sold in Sephora. But there are also two National Historic Landmarks, Madam Walker's House in Irvington, New York, and the Madam Walker Legacy Center in Indianapolis. So there are lots of initiatives. So I, I think Madam Walker's having a moment right now, <laughs> you know, 101 years after her death. It's so exciting. So exciting. Thank you so much for all the work that you have done to bring her to us, to readers, and um, to new generation of, um, you know, people who are learning for the first time about her, those of us who thought we knew something, uh, your book has just done so much. And hopefully this series will have people return to the book because there's a new edition of the book out, right? There is. So the original title, On Her Own Ground, and it's now self-made with Octavia Spencer on the cover for temporarily while we're sort of writing this movie tie-in. And then it will go back to On Her Own Ground. But people can, you know, buy that. They can come to my website, ameliabundles.com, but, you know, also your independent bookstore and Amazon. Thank you so much. We're ready for Q&A now. So we'll, we'll turn it over to Donna. Thank you, Farah. And certainly thank you, Alelia, for sharing your story and all the background of writing the book and researching and certainly working with Hollywood. So we have lots of questions that have been coming in. Um, the first that I'll share is, what was the most surprising or unexpected thing you learned about Madam C.J. Walker and your family during the course of your research? Great question. Um, so what I knew about Madam Walker was what a lot of people knew, that she, was, she developed a hair care product, um, was born on a plantation in Delta, Louisiana, became a millionaire and employed lots of women. But what I didn't know when I first started my research is just how politically active she was and, um, how, and really what an amazing marketer she was. So one key thing that I learned about her during the 19, the teens, she was very outspoken, very militant about the rights of African-Americans and very involved in the anti-lynching movement. And she and Ida B. Wells, who became a friend of hers, of course, the woman for the anti-lynching movement, were spied upon by a black spy who worked for the War Department during World War I. And they were called Negro subversives. And I found this in some classified material at the National Archives. And that made me love her even more. Great. Um, another question's coming in. in the series, they make it seem that Walker dreams and thinks of ideas and then it happens. But of course, she must have, ha must have faced numerous obstacles. I haven't read your book, but plan to. Can you describe one or two examples of obstacles that Madam C.J. Walker faced? No, absolutely. She, you know, as a woman who had very little formal education, she had to surround herself with people who would inspire her, who would help educate her. So that was overcoming that. And then the doubt that other people had. She said when she first started out, people told her she'd never make train fare from one town to the next. But she really believed in herself. But she had come to believe in herself because of the mentoring with other people. And I will say in the film, you see Booker T. Washington. So that's kind of exaggerated. They got off to a rocky start. Eventually, there was a, a mutual respect. But when she did try to speak at his first convention, he sort of brushed her off, but she still came to the fore. And, and, but, did, but instead of it being a contentious relationship forever, they were able to create a collaboration. Um, as an acclaimed author who has published many books, what advice do you have for young women of color who seek to do that in this day and age? Um, get a good mentor. <laughs> But I, you know, and I, will, I say that and people talk about mentors, but one of the things that has really been helpful to me, Donna, is my work with alumni associations, both in college and graduate school, that I became involved and was given lots of leadership roles 
And it was something that there were times when my work was frustrating to me, when I had a boss sometimes who I didn't get along with, but I could exercise some of those leadership qualities and some of those skills by being involved and by giving back. And of course, got more than I was ever able to give. So I would say just, you know, use your alumni association as you are moving along. Great. I love the plug for the Alumni Association. <laughs> it's an honest. It's honest. <laughs> and I will share that Alelia has been a Columbia Alumni Association board member and leader for so many years and provided so much advice and insight. Um, we're so grateful for her volunteerism and uh, over the past almost decade, I would say. Yes. <laughs> Um, so another question, self-made underplayed Madam C.J. Walker's philanthropic support for anti-lynching efforts and racial justice efforts. Can you speak to the philanthropic traditions, particularly in the context of racial justice movements of Madam C.J. Walker and possibly your grandmother? No, absolutely. I mean, and, and you're right. I think the story was in the melodrama. It really kind of got, you know, a whole lot with that conflict between the two women. And then it originally was supposed to be 10 episodes and got cut down to four. So the script writer and showrunners had a, a lot to condense. And that was one of the things that got left out. But I really would love if it's, if it's ever done again to show more about how she became a philanthropist. And part of it is that as a really poor woman, a washerwoman in St. Louis, it was the women of her church, St. Paul AME, the, the missionary society, the club women who really began to give her poor Sarah a vision of herself as something other than an illiterate washerwoman. And so that when she began to become prosperous, she encouraged her agents to do the same thing. When she held her first convention of her sales agents in 1917, she told them, your first duty is to humanity. I want others to look at us as Walker agents and realize that we care not just about ourselves, but about others. And she gave prizes, not just to the women who sold the most products, but to the women who brought in the most for charity. And at the end of the convention, the women sent a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson, urging him to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime because the riots in East St. Louis had just happened. So every, what she did was very much involved with, yes, you are prosperous, but part of your prosperity needs to be to uplift your community. So further to that, if we had Madam C.J. Walker with us today, according to you, what is the one issue or challenge Madam Walker would take on with her entrepreneurial and change maker spirit and mindset? Black Lives Matter. <laughs> but I also think it's investment in women. You know, two to three percent of venture capital, only two to three percent of venture capital goes to women owned businesses. So I think she would be very involved in that. And I will say one of the bonuses of Richard Lou Dennis's involvement with Madam Walker's legacy is that he has created something called the New Voices Fund, a $100 million venture capital fund for women of color entrepreneurs. And part of that ties into this legacy of Madam Walker and trying to support women-owned businesses. What did you think about the music in the film? You know, the music kind of went, <laughs> went right by me, I have to admit. I was, because I know about the music that Madam Walker and Alelia Walker listened to in, in, during the period. For a little while, when they were in you know, dire straits, they lived across the alley from Tom Turpin's Rosebud Cafe, which is where Scott Joplin played. And in their church, Sarah was in the choir. And their, this, their church had the state of the art, a state of the art organ, and their organist was a classically trained opera tenor. So they were getting this combination of music on the street, ragtime and cakewalk dances. And the Germans who lived in St. Louis were working with some of the ragtime musicians. So they had a rich, um, palette of music. They were very good friends with people like James Reese Europe and James Weldon Johnson, who, whose music I would have loved to have seen, but I know that the scriptwriter wanted to have a more contemporary feel. So 
I, I the music was fine, but I I kind of wanted period music. That's just me. What did you think of the casting of Tiffany Haddish in the series? I thought she was very different from Alelia Walker. I, I thought it was a it was an interesting choice. Um and if you had to choose someone else, would you have chosen someone else? Well, you know, no. because I've been thinking about this this for 20 years, some of the actors and actresses who I would have chosen 20 years ago are now 20 years older. So, um, but, but there was a point when I really thought um, Queen Latifah embodied for me what I imagined Alelia Walker's spirit and, you know, stature to be like. Interesting. Is there any info on Madam C.J. Walker's mother who would have been born in slavery? The only thing I know about her is her name. Her name was Minerva Anderson, and her father's name was Owen Breedlove. And I have been able to find some information, but it's really more, as I was doing the research, I discovered that the family who had owned her parents and uh, older siblings and on whose plantation she was born still owned the land and they have become friends of mine so we talk about you know the fact that they still own this plantation um and 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 i have done a lot of research on their family and that particular plantation was a staging area for ulysses s grant during the siege of vicksburg which means there's quite a bit of information so i know the context of her parents and older siblings' lives, but I really don't know a lot about her mother. You've said it was important to be as accurate as possible, yet we know that Hollywood values played a role. What fictionalized element would you most have liked to have portrayed accurately? <laughs> I, I, would, I really would not have done the, the, I wouldn't have played up this conflict between Madam Walker and her rival that would have been a very small part for me. I would have dealt, developed more with the relationship between mother and daughter. I would have made the character, the Alelia character, less flighty. And I really would have focused on some of the women, the club women from that period of time, the African-American women who really were creating institutions who founded the National Association of Colored Women in 1896 before the NAACP. I would have loved to have seen this kind of women supporting women and how much Sarah benefited from that and then how much she turned around and used that to encourage and uplift and empower other women. I also would have, rather than the scene with um, John D. Rockefeller, I would have shown some of the other Black men who were politically powerful and in business who she really consulted rather than a, than a, Rock, than a John D. Rockefeller. Um, so These are I, great questions. Yeah, they're, they're coming in so fast. I'm reading as quickly as I can, and I apologize that we can't get them all in. Um, but um, uh, Christina writes, I love how your book highlights the struggles of becoming successful as a Black woman in America. Do you think anything has changed since then when it comes to us women of color, especially when it comes to having our voices heard? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I think that we, the, we have such an opportunity for education that people are starting their own businesses. And I think that you know, the ability to network with each other, to gain from each other, those things that our ancestors had no access to, we are very fortunate to have access to. But I do think some of the... Um, the biases, the assumptions of inferiority, the assumption that you're probably not going to be as good as somebody else when in fact you may be better. Um, you know, those kind of low expectations are still there. And then the uh, assumption that, that you can't hang out, that you can't really perform. And it's just not true. But we still have to, we still have to battle those biases. Um, so there is an Indiana native um, watching and you reference a number of Indianapolis landmarks. Are they accessible today? Yes. Yeah, so the, um, the Madam Walker Legacy Center, which was built in 1927, 
is um, getting ready to have a grand reopening as soon as we get are able to finish the construction after because of COVID. But it will it's undergoing a fifteen million dollar renovation. It's a beautiful um, African Art Deco theater that will reopen in June, we hope, or sometime during the summer. The Indiana Historical Society is the place where the, this extensive Madam Walker collection is. And there's right now a Madam Walker exhibit with actors who are reenacting Madam Walker's 1915 um, office. So those things will, with COVID, when we get to the next stage, those things will be reopened. Great. So there is an alum who knows an incoming student to the journalism school at Columbia. What advice do you have to maximize the experience? Listen to your professors. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, I, what, my experience there, I just tried to take advantage of everything. I had some great professors. I tried things that I didn't think I was really going to be interested in, I, you know, to really, you're in New York. And New York is such an amazing laboratory for learning and for reporting. And the members of the faculty in most instances are really seasoned reporters. And also your classmates are people with whom you will stay in touch and stay involved in the Alumni Association after you graduate. <laughs> Thank you, Alilia. Um, so is there a question that wasn't asked, and obviously you've been doing many of these talks as you've been promoting the series and your book. Um, is there anything we haven't asked that um, you typically get asked that you think is important to share? You know, these are, these are really great questions. I, I don't think that there's anything that I haven't been, been asked, but I, I will say that one of the lessons for me um, in this experience is that there are all of these great stories uh, that haven't been told that are going to be making their way to the screen. And as we see these stories, because except for Columbia students who know history well, <laughs> most people do not really learn history. And these stories of like wealthy African-Americans who had businesses, that's new to most people. So I would just say, you know, continue to read widely. And actually, I have a question for Farah because I know there are many stories that, that are coming out of faculty members and students, graduate students. So I'm curious what kinds of things you're seeing that, may, that we may end up seeing on the screen at some point. Well, there's so much wonderful work uh, that students are doing, that faculty are doing. Um, my colleague, Mignon Moore, is working on um, LGBTQ elders and their stories, what it was like to create community, you know, in a, in a time that wasn't as welcoming as it is right now. Um, my colleague Carl Hart's work, um, which is autobiographical, but also about his work as a um, scientist around issues having to do with addiction. I mean, there are just so many exciting stories, so much in the past to waiting to be uncovered. Um, and, you know, we live in New York, we were here in New York, we we're here in Harlem. Um, I tell my students, there are undiscovered stories waiting for you to discover within a walk up to the Schomburg. You know, the great Anne Petrie's papers are there, or James Baldwin's papers, or people whose names we don't even know. Um, so I agree with you. I think it's, it's, a, it's a rich mind just waiting for us to discover. So one last question for both of you. Um, one of the alums asked, what book are you currently reading now? So I actually just finished, uh, I mentioned this, Sarah Broom's The Yellow House. It is fantastic. I read it for my book club. I actually listened to it on audio. But for those who haven't read it, um, she, she's from New Orleans. She's from a huge family, 12 children. She's the youngest of 12. She lives in New York. She worked for O Magazine. She's had other interesting jobs, but she went back and investigated what her family went through, both as a living in, in New Orleans and what they went through during Katrina and post Katrina. But it is just beautifully written and it, give, it gave me a sense of a family um, and a story that's, that's usually not told. It's a wonderful book. Um, well, I'm rereading um, Octavia Butler, the writer of speculative fiction, and I'm rereading her because when this hit and my students were scattered to the four corners of the earth, I went to what our final readings would be, 
and I thought it would be a good time for us to take our time and read Octavia Butler together. Her um, Parable of the Sower is set in 2024. When it came out in 93, that seemed like it would be forever, but right now it's right around the corner. It's a period of ecological disaster, um, a period that in many ways feels like what we're going through now, and yet um, the central question of it is how are we going to remake the world? And so it's a really, I are loving it. Okay, I think we may have lost Farah for a second. Well, I want to thank both of you, Farah and Alelia. This was tremendous. We loved your insight. Um, and what a way to start off Columbia at home. Um, thank you uh, to our alumni. I encourage you to join us um, for Columbia at Home on April 29th. Um, it will be a program called The World and Wine featuring three Columbia winemakers. Um, if you're interested, have a glass of wine next to you um, while you're getting some advice um, from our winemakers. You'll receive an email with registration later this week. Thank you so much for participating. Um, and most importantly at this time, Stay healthy, stay safe, um, and please connect with us. Uh, we're here for, for you however you need. Thanks, and have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, depending on where you're um, Zooming in from. Bye.